Pan Pan Psychast. Hello and welcome to part four, where we're gonna end notes from underground. I've just sprung that upon you both. Oh, oh, I was both definitely relaxed. ready. <laughs> Ollie, do you want to give us a quick summary? Put me down, every- Andy. <laughs> <laughs> What's everything that's happened so far in a few words? Ollie? Okay, so the story of notes from underground, part D. So far, we have the underground man, or affectionately referred to as Mr. Man, Mm. who has uh, been uh, humiliated by a six-foot officer who he didn't start a fight with. Uh, He then didn't have a duel with his friend Fafichkin and didn't slap his uh, kind of friend Zerkov in a party. He has then gone to a brothel and met Liza, who he has completely humiliated and belittled in a horrific manner. He gave her his address in a moment of kindness, yeah, vulnerability. Air quotes from Molly there. Yeah, actually. air quotes there, sorry. Uh, and now he has gone home. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to find out what his home life is like. I'm sure it will be domestic bliss and uh, see what happens to the final kind of few chapters of this story in which we'll see if our underground man is just going to go full goth and be miserable for the whole story or if something else may happen. I think I know who the underground man is. I think Who's all it? along there's a little bit of the underground man in all of us. <laughs> That would be a really inspirational yeah. thing to say if he wasn't a horrible person. <laughs> there is a little bit of the underground man in Putin. That's the end of the story. So that that's it. So we've got our penultimate scene here. We find ourselves in the underground man's apartment. It's quite an empty scene. And then we've got our final scene, which is quite short. So feast your ears on our penultimate reading of Notes from Underground. Scene five, body and blood. Location, the apartment. Something is on my mind, Apollon. The other night, I had a quite peculiar encounter with a beautiful woman. One day passed, another and another. She did not come, and I began to grow calmer. I felt particularly bold and cheerful after nine o'clock. I even sometimes began dreaming, and rather sweetly. I, for instance, became the salvation of Liza, simply through her coming to me, and me talking to her. I develop her, I educate her. Finally, I notice that she loves me, loves me passionately. You know how weird that sounds, right? I pretend not to understand. I don't know why I pretend, just for effect perhaps. At least all confusion, transfigured, trembling and sobbing. She flings herself at my feet and says, You are my saviour and I love you better than anything in the world. Liza, can you imagine that I have not noticed your love? I saw it all, I divined it. But I did not dare to approach you first, because I had an influence over you and was afraid that you would force yourself, from gratitude, to respond to my love. Would you try to rouse in your heart a feeling which was perhaps absent? And I did not wish that, because it would be tyranny. It would be indelicate. But now, now you are mine. You are my creation. You are pure. You are good. You are my noble wife. I will be your noble wife. Into my house come born and free my noble mistress to be. That's very romantic. You seem to be having a moment to your sen. Do you want me to leave? It is a good thing, in fact, that you distracted my attention at this time by your rudeness. You drove me beyond all patience. You are the bane of my life, the curse laid upon me by providence. We have been squabbling continually for years. I am not your biggest fan either. This place is a shit whore. <laughs> my God, how I hate you. I believe I had never hated anyone in my life as I hate you. There could be no doubt that you look upon me as the greatest fool on earth. You could not live in a furnace lodgings. This lodgings is the private solitude, your shell, your cave, in which you concealed yourself from all mankind. I made up my mind for some reason, and with some object to punish Apollon, and not to pay him for a fortnight the wages that were owing him. I had for a long time, for the last two years, been intending to do this, simply in order to teach him not to give himself airs with me, and to show him that if I liked, I could withhold his wages. I lost my temper and flew at him in a fury. I was irritated beyond endurance apart from him. I am out of here. Stay, stay, come back, come back. I tell you, say something. How dare you come and look at me like the answer? Why are you even here? Chill, bro. 
If you have any order to give me, it's my duty as more responsible housemate to carry it out. That's not what I'm asking you about, you torturer. I'll tell you why you came here myself. You see, I don't give you your wages. You are so proud, you don't want to bow down and ask for it. Stupid, stupid, stupid. Let go of me. Listen, here's the money, do you see? Here it is. Here's the seven rubles complete. But you are not going to have it. You are not going to have it until you come respectfully with bowed heads to beg my pardon. Do you hear? That cannot be. Apollon, go at once without a minute's delay and fetch the police officer. Excuse me? Go at once. Go this minute. Go on, or else you can't imagine what will happen. You are certainly out of your mind. Whoever heard of a man sending for the police officer against himself? And for being a frightened... You are upsetting yourself about nothing, for nothing will come of it. Go! At that instant, a figure came in, stopped short, and began staring at us in perplexity. I stood there before her, crushed, crestfallen, revoltingly confused, and I believe I smiled as I did my utmost to wrap myself in the skirts of my ragged dressing gown, exactly as I had imagined the scene not long before in a fit of desperation. Please, Liza, sit down. Let me move these chairs. You have found me in a strange position. I can't imagine how you can live in a place like this. I, I will sit down, but it is worse than the brothel. No, no, no. Don't imagine anything. I am not ashamed of my poverty. On the contrary, I look with pride on my poverty. I am poor but honourable. One can be poor and honourable. However, would you like tea? No. Uh, Apollon, get back here. Here are your wages. You see, I give them to you. But for that, you must come to my rescue. Bring me tea and vegan sausage rolls from Greg's. If you won't go, you'll make me a miserable man. You don't know what this woman, this, this is everything. You may be imagining something, but you don't know what that woman is. Shall I get two or four? I will kill you. I shouted suddenly, striking the table with my fist so that the ink spurted out of the inkstand. What are you saying? And can I, I have a sausage roll? I will kill him! Kill him! You don't know, Liza, what that torturer is to me. He is my torturer. He has gone now to fetch some sausage rolls. He... <laughs> what is the matter? What is wrong? The, the vegan sausage rolls taste just like the normal sausage rolls. <laughs> I guess. <laughs> At that moment, a pollen bore in the tea. We have peppermint and red bush. But no chamomile. It suddenly seemed to me that this commonplace prosaic tea was horribly undignified and paltry. Liza looked at Apollon with positive alarm. I'll dust to Greg's real quick. Back in a more. Our silence lasted for five minutes. The tea stood on the table. We did not touch it. Several times she glanced at me with mournful perplexity. I want to get away from it. I want to get away from here altogether. My heart positively ached with pity for her tactless and unnecessary straightforwardness. But something hideous at once stifled all compassion in me. It even provoked me to greater venom. I did not care what happened. Perhaps I'm in your way. Why have you come to me? Tell me that, please. I'll tell you, my good girl, why you have come. You've come because I talked sentimental stuff to you then. So now you are soft as butter and longing for fine sentiments again. So you may as well know that I was laughing at you then. Why are you shuddering? Yes, I was laughing at you. I had been insulted just before, at dinner, by the fellows who came that evening before me. I came to you, meaning to thrash one of them, an officer. But I didn't succeed. I didn't find him. I had to avenge the insult on someone to get back my own again. That's what it was. And you imagined I had come there on purpose to save you? Yes, you imagined that. Said you would save me. Save you? Save you from what? And the devil knows why. I gave you my address in my folly. Folly? Afterwards, before I got home, I was cursing and swearing at you because of that address. I hated you already. Well, anyway, I know that I am a blaggard, a scoundrel, an egoist, a sluggard. Here I have been shuddering for the last three days at the thought of you coming. And do you know what has worried me particularly for these three days? That I posed as such a hero to you. Now you would see me in a wretched, torn dressing gown. I shall never forgive you either. Yes, you must answer for it all. Because you are a blackguard. Because you are the nastiest, stupidest, absurdest and most envious of all the worms on earth. You shall always be insulted by every louse. That is your doom. And what is it to me that you don't understand a word of this? And what do I care? Do you understand how I shall hate you now after saying this, for having been here and listening? Why, it's not once in a lifetime a man speaks out like this, and then it is in hysterics. 
What more do you want? Why do you still stand confronting me? After all this, why are you worrying me? Why won't you go? You are so sick, it would not be right for me to leave. She was so crushed. Poor girl. She considered herself infinitely beneath me. How could she feel anger or resentment? She suddenly leapt up from her chair with an irresistible impulse and held up her hands, yearning towards me, though still timid and not daring to stir. At this point, there was a revulsion in my heart too, and she suddenly rushed to me, threw her arms around me and burst into tears. I too could not restrain myself and sobbed as I have never had before. I feel your pain. They won't let me. I can't be good. Why am I so ashamed? I don't know, but I am now. Our parts now are completely changed. You are now the heroine, while well, I am just crushed and humiliated as a creature as you have been before me that night four days ago. I know you, a man of the underground. You were always a humiliated creature. How I hated you and how I am drawn to you at this very minute. I am back. Bad news is they've <laughs> run out of sausage rolls. <laughs> The good news is that they've got loads of vegan steak bakes. Enough for everyone. What did I... What did I miss? <laughs> so, in the book, what we've got is four days of the underground man thinking, why did I even give her my address? Like, I shouldn't have done that. Oh, no, I am glad I've done that. I really wanted to come. No, actually, I don't want her to be here. She might see me in my poverty. And just as he kicks off on what is his flatmate in our rendition, but actually his servant in the main storyline notes from underground, is he kicks off on him. He says, look, here's your money. You're not having it. Being spiteful, showing him that he's in charge like he tried to with his school friend, like he tried to with Liza in the earlier scene. It's that same kind of thing. And then just as he sends his servant off to the police station, because he's literally just like flipped his lid after all these years of being passive aggressive towards his servant, then Liza comes in and it's the timing's brilliant. If, when I read it, I was like, that's so good. Like yeah, how she yeah, yeah. just came in at this moment when things are so the worst time, <laughs> yeah, literally yeah. the worst time to come in. And then he has to beg his servant to go and get some, like, <laughs> yeah. is it like scones or something in yeah, the actual yeah, text? Yeah. But yeah. we've, we took liberties and, <laughs> and said vegan sausage rolls, which I preferred. <laughs> and, <laughs> and yet, and like, so it, the, the servant does eventually after a bit of dilly dallying actually does decide to go. Mm. Uh, and then they, and they have this confrontation. And again, in the text, it, it makes it appear as if they do have sex again. Mm. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah it, missed that again. And, and, so and, prudish, Jack. And, and that's the, that's the, the interesting thing that, uh, as we'll, <laughs> the bit that we finished off on is, is that it, he, they have this, they have this argument and, and this is after, after they've had sex and then he wants to give her a note like some rupees and and she refuses to take it and, mm. and it's this moment where you know he he's like you're you know you're you're still this prostitute and yeah. she's like i'm not taking your money she throws um, it just on the side he sees it later yeah. isn't he just just a reminder of her place just a reminder that he's still in charge he's mm. obsessed with this idea note the servant though how much of a better character he is than the underground man he spites in the underground man to his servant. Yet the servant still is big enough and tall enough to, to put that aside and still do what he thinks is the right thing or do a compassionate, unconditional act of kindness to the underground man, despite the underground man being literally the worst person <laughs> in the world. <laughs> it takes some real strength, doesn't it, to be manipulated to that extent for so long, have your money waved in your face, you're not getting this, I'm better than you. And then be like, oh, I'll go and fetch you some tea. <laughs> Just like, <laughs> yeah, I love that. About it. It's my duty as a servant. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> what am I paying you for? But also, I'm not paying you. <laughs> We've got a complete flip and reversal from the earlier brothel scene. Earlier on, we had Liza break down to the underground man. And then it flips over in this other way where the underground man's now breaking down to Liza. Is the imagery here supposed to be one being the strong figure? Is there any imagery here? Well, I, th I think there is, there is certainly the, the thematic twist of, of him as you quite rightly said, his position, at least in his own eyes, has has sunk down. But and she is now the person who who he must confess to. Whereas it appears as if when he's d down in the brothel, is that she's the one that is ultimately the sinner who yeah. who must have oh, good. That, that must have something to to confess. And he's somehow like taking this role of almost like the priest who mm. who will pardon her. Mm. And yeah, and, and now he's the person that must be pardoned. But of course, he's still too spiteful and and too confused within himself and he, he does he does just break down at this yeah. point and and it's hard to follow exactly what he wants from this situation um other than just a sheer flail and power grab um and it all just blows up in his face much like every other event that he's <laughs> mm, yeah. experienced so far scene seven 
Long live the underground. Location, the apartment. I understand it all. I realize that your outburst of passion had simply been revenge, a fresh humiliation, and that to your earlier, almost causeless hatred was added now a personal hatred, born of envy. I may not understand it distinctly, but I certainly understand that you are a despicable man, and what is worse, incapable of loving me. Uh, you two seem to be having a heart-to-heart. -heart. I'm, I'm just going to go downstairs and pretend I'm not listening. Liza, it is incredible to be as spiteful and as stupid as I am. It was strange that I should not love you, or at any rate, appreciate your love. But now I am incapable of love, for I repeat, with me, loving means tyranny and showing my moral superiority. I have never in my life been able to imagine any other sort of love. I want you to disappear. I want peace to be left alone in my underground world. Real life oppresses me with its novelty so much that I can hardly breathe. Goodbye, she said, going towards the door. I ran up to her, seized her hand, opened it, thrust something in it, and closed it again. Then I turned at once and dashed away in haste to the other corner of the room to avoid seeing her. But I don't want to lie, and so I will say straight out that I opened her hand and put the money in it, from spite. Oh, underground man. Are you just gonna go watch her leave? Have you never seen a rom-com? This is the moment where you chase after her and embrace her in the snow. Liza! Liza! No answer. But at that minute I heard the stiff outer glass door open heavily with a creak and slam violently. The sound echoed up the stairs. She had gone. I went back to my room in hesitation. I felt horribly oppressed. A minute passed. Suddenly I stared. Straight ahead before me, on the table I saw it. In short, I saw a crumpled blue five-ruble note. The one I had thrust into her hand a minute before. It was the same note. It could be no other. There was no other in the flat. Well, you might have expected she would have done that. A minute later, I ran headlong after her. She could not have gone more than 200 paces away when I ran out into the street. It was a still night, and the snow was falling down onto the pavement. Where had she gone, and why am I running after her? Would it not be better that she should keep the resentment of the insult forever? Resentment. Why? It is purification. It is a most stinging and painful consciousness. Tomorrow I should have defiled her soul and have exhausted her heart, where now the feeling of insult will never die in her heart. And however lonesome the filth awaiting her, the feeling of insult will elevate and purify her by hatred. Hmm. It makes you think, doesn't it? Which is better? Cheap happiness or exalted suffering? Well, which is better? The notes of this paradoxalist do not end here. He could not help himself and went on. But it also seems to us that this may be a good place to stop. Oh, beautifully read. It felt like uh, Charlie from Flowers for Algernon was in the room towards the end with uh, Mr. Donna from The Butchers. Yeah, the we started room. off in Russia <laughs> and ended up in New York. <laughs> the streets of New York, which kind of sound like the north of England. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure it came out fine. And yeah. if it didn't, well, we've separated the uh, the sheep from the goats in terms of our listeners. Those loyal followers that follow us no matter what we do. <laughs> and the and people that, that will... switched off uh, episode <laughs> two. Episodes. And the people that demand good content. <laughs> we bow our heads to both of you. It's really interesting at the end there. We've got that start that we had at the very start of the novel we have Dostoevsky saying we can put these notes away they carry on I'm just reporting this person's thoughts to you uh, objectively as if he just found them in that final scene then we see the underground man seem to regret his decision to turn Liza away and be spiteful towards her she seems to show her strength and show that no actually I don't need you look at you and you're being horrible to me still sending me away I'll just go and maybe doesn't expect her to do that. She's risked so much by going there. She's in debt to the to the brothel. And she runs away, essentially, to him, expecting to be saved. She gets there. He can't help her at all. And she's probably realizing, wow, I've made such a massive mistake. And he's like, oh, you know, expect me to do these things. And he's horrible to her again. And then, then she just leaves. And, and power to her. She's the stronger character in, in the novel, isn't she? I think here is where the underground man, thankfully, that... I guess nobody has ever been in a long-term relationship with this man, or at least it appears to be the case, because uh, he doesn't seem to, after the 20 years after this event, to have ever been able to, to find someone mm. again. And for good reason, he, this is almost classic abusive behavior where yeah. he, he comes in and tries to intimidate. And the moment she actually says, no, you're pathetic. 
I'm leaving. And then suddenly he wants to grovel and get her back. But you just know that if she was to to to, to take pity on him and go back, is that he's going to repeat this again yeah. and again and again. Thankfully, she had the sense to leave him before anything else could have happened. Mm. And, and what seems to be the key here is the, is the money, because he gives her the money and she rejects it, which from her perspective is a poor working girl. That's for him sends a direct message that maybe the reason she came there wasn't just for a a transaction that actually she has quite a lot of integrity even though in the previous chapters he's kind of ripped her to pieces that she actually walks out of the story with her head held high and with a with a sense that she's actually not on his level that he is Mm. he's the one humiliated again this time by a prostitute Mm. so the whole novel was just a series of humiliations after humiliations after human like can you sink much lower yeah and there's nothing there's absolutely nothing morally commendable or likable about this character but you can see how someone might read this in their teenage years and feel like Oh, that's not mean to sound derogatory, but I think there's that kind of teenage angst of someone that might read this novel who's like, oh, F the world. I'm really clever. I think about things really deeply and I suffer in social situations like that kind of nerd like uh, trope. <laughs> Right? <laughs> you said it. You might... Nerd. <laughs> nerd. <laughs> Bloody geek. Like but you can imagine, like, imagine <laughs> the trope of a nerd who reads loads, thinks they're really clever, and um, because they've read some Nietzsche and some of the other existentialists, <laughs> or even at least that is what that. And then they go out in the world and they're thinking, why don't all the girls like me? Why aren't I the coolest person at the table? I've got loads of things to say about the death of God. And then they think, oh, well, maybe it's just because I'm better than everybody else. And they use different interactions to prove that to themselves, like with Liza and the school classmate. And then we realize that, no, he's... He, but you can see why someone might romanticize mm. him. But I think the point is, don't romanticize him, because oh, that's yeah. where you'll end up. Absolutely. He is... He is- fallen into the pit of and this is very much a thread throughout the entire thing of the over intellectualizing stuff Mm. she liza early on uh says that he speaks as if he is speaking from a book he has no yeah he has no way of of explaining himself in a comfortable human interaction where he feels he can be at peace with the person he is communicating with Mm. and that causes that inertia he he overthinks everything and his only defense mechanism is to continue to believe that he is just too intelligent for these Mm. fools Mm -hmm. and that that's the problem and that maybe actually he just needs to be able to see himself honestly but he can't do that which is ironic because he does want to try and do that he's he's obsessed with this sense that oh no he sees things for the way things actually are he's completely lost in the in the woods he kind of just lacks a basic compassion for others he mentions that all of his relationships are built around domination and power well this is where domination and power gets you sad alone crying in the snow because nobody wants to be with you nobody wants to be in a relationship with you or be your friend you're just on your own underground in your hole and like andy said he's in a pit and it's a it's almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy and cycle Mm. he's never going to get out of this or it's implied that he's never going to get out of this cycle of just self-loathing yeah and like you know where, where does it begin right so i hate myself and everyone sucks so therefore no one wants to talk to me because I'm miserable. So therefore everyone's miserable and everything sucks. Like where, where does the cycle break? Well, I think it's Andy touched on something uh, really important maybe in the last section when you were like, we didn't mention this about the rational egotists, is that they're really egotistical. <laughs> in, that, in part one, we might read it as if you're hyper rational, then you're never going to figure things out. You're never going to get things done. Right. And, and, and that's the, the big problem. And we talk about the problems with the hyper rationalists and, and the crystal palace are not accounting for freedom in the second part the egotist their loving relationships are always to their own ends it's always for them to get the power or get something for themselves and maybe the message from dostoevsky is we shouldn't be hyper rational like part one because we want to stick our tongue out we want to be free mm. we don't want to be egotistical in the second part because it will lead us to put ourselves before others and again this third way maybe there's a way of no we love people for their sake we love others first and that's the kind of relationship we should have not the kind that the underground man wants and and this is the kind of love that's missing from the underground man right so the self selfless compassion for other people mm. and liza seems to have a bit of that maybe not incredibly developed but she seems to at least somewhat sympathize with this guy a little bit <laughs> and if i have no idea why because he's a monster and that's actually something that explores again in some of his other books as well there's a lot of characters that are stuck without this moral goodness to get them out of that quagmire of 
atheism and nihilism and self-centeredness. And on, the, on that note as well, I've not had the opportunity to read too many books by Dostoevsky, but in, in all of the introductory stuff I read on his themes is that one of the clear images is how, and this is perhaps something that in feminist critique could come up, is he, it's this sense that through lo a loving female presence can a man be redeemed. Of course, there's also the religious element of through Christ you can be redeemed. Mm -hmm. But this loving relationship that a man might find, or a heterosexual man might find with a woman, is lost on the underground man yeah. he he has perhaps this golden opportunity this woman has come to him and he can't get beyond that that crippling sense mm. of of dread that she's seeing him in poverty and that then he has to just blow it all up in his own face and he can't he can't accept the offer Liza as well is like I think we've spoken about in our Developments of Christian Thought audio book, which we haven't plugged in a very long time. So go to our website. It's really good. <laughs> no, it's Give it a listen. It's all right. And um, <laughs> we, no, it's doing it a slight disservice. We have in there, like we spoke about, we spoke about gender and contemporary society in there. We have Liza like as other, as means to the man's like ends. And it's not the other way around. And Dostoevsky's works are all like this, aren't they? The woman isn't the main character. The man is the male character. And the woman's just seen as a plot device or something to show us what the, the man's character could be like with her or without her. But one other a positive reading from this, when we read it through a feminist lens, is that the male characters in this aren't ones we want to be like at all. And Liza, although she's um, you know, selling her body, she's the only one in the entire story that seems to have a little bit of moral fiber. Mm. She wants to live a good life. She wants to leave that stuff behind her. Um, and, and she takes the first ticket she has back to what, what we think is the right Tao. <laughs> <laughs> and she has autonomy in this story. She, although that when we first meet her, she is a prostitute and is paid for by the underground man and, you know, ridiculed. She makes the ultimate choice. Like she comes out of this story with the quote power i guess you know she 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 can do far better than the underground man that's for sure and the fact that he completely rejects her she doesn't hang around and go no no it's okay i'm just gonna plot device mm. and save you like she's gone she's not coming back even in the novel like there is no kind of uh, foreshadowing that he might catch up with her or something like that was his chance and he blew it yeah. and she's gone and she's probably gonna hopefully find a way to be happy and fulfilled in her own way hmm. right at the end i'm left thinking this narrator is so unreliable. I don't know how much of this we can take to be true from from his part. Andy mentioned again earlier in the section that he's writing this 20 years in the future. My memory is not that good. I can't remember what we were saying 20 minutes ago, for example. We've got at the very start of the novel, just to go right the way back. Do you remember he's talking about working in the office? Mm. And he says something like, I don't look at the others because I'm so modest about my intelligence that I wouldn't look in their direction as if like he can't look at them because he's so proud of his intelligence mm. that he's worried that other people are intimidated by it like and he's just not looking at them because like he's cowardly because he's actually socially crippled and th th those little nuggets are passed through the entire book I can't necessarily spot many right at the end here but it'd be a surprise if all of a sudden these last few pages of the book were completely free of unreliable narrating and finally he's managed to give a complete a full confession but it seems like this event is really important he's given us this one story to tell us why he's in the underground so maybe liza was his last chance at oh actually i'm not going to treat other people like crap mm -hmm. maybe i'm actually going to try and express some unconditional love maybe i'm going to try and get the right balance between romanticism and rationalism mm -hmm. and maybe i'm not going to overthink i can just act and help somebody yeah and i kind of like to a certain extent that he's not really redeemed you know, it says at the start of the book that he is a, a fictitious character, but a representation of people that may be out there and that these people, to a certain extent, do exist and don't have happy endings, quote unquote. In, in other Dostoevsky novels, people do horrible things and do get redeemed. But in this one, it doesn't seem to fit. It's kind of a an unfinished ending. You know, we we have the first section where he's older, reflecting on his rambling philosophy, and we flash back to this story which feels like it might be the root of some of that of experiences mm. but he's obviously had 20 other years of life does it include other stories that are similar has he literally just sat in his flat and just written journals for 20 years mm. There's, it's almost like it doesn't finish with a full stop it kind of finishes at the halfway through but also yeah these people might still be out there this guy might still be there in some sense he could be in all of us Ollie is what you're saying. Yeah, but you say it like in a hopeful, yeah. good way. Like, <laughs> please, let everybody be as disgusting as I am. 
Some people say 2 plus 2 equals 4. I say that 1908 minus 1986 would be the wrong way to read out the dates of our mystery philosopher. The mystery philosopher! As long as there have been men and they have lived, they have all felt this tragic ambiguity of their condition. But as long as there have been philosophers and they have thought, most of them have tried to mask it. Our last existentialist, who could that be? Simone de Beauvoir? It's Simone de Beauvoir. Well done, Ollie. You were saying, you were saying recently in the after show, back in after Taoism, if mm. my memory serves me well, that Simone de Beauvoir has ended up being one of, if not, your favourite philosopher. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think she, I might think be listening. Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, cheating on a virtue episode. So, Mister Underground, we are here again. Vegan sausage roll. <laughs> <laughs> Looks like. You're Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was that great. Was that was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. That yeah, was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>